Welcome everybody, welcome to the channel. Now, this video is a little bit different. You'll have seen the thumbnail, you'll have seen the title. A lot of folks laugh at us and they laugh at me and they say, Phil, you only do a four day week and Fridays are just free for all, you know, do what we want. It's not a case of that. Fridays to us, as a firm, we need a day where we can do the, the quotes, the invoices, go out and see customers, sort jobs out, and really like a paperwork day. We've got the HMRC to sort out, we've got the work on the computer. So Fridays to me, even though people think that we're not working, we are actually working. It's just, we move our work time from being out at night looking at jobs and we've moved it to a Friday because it just makes it more sense. People want to see you in the daytime and not at night. So. I just thought for a different video for you to watch instead of me just showing you Doris the door painting in my studio showing you different paints I thought it'd be nice to do a bit of an interview with my father now you've seen him on a few videos over the last few years since we've been doing YouTube so just as a bit of a different video for me I thought I'd do a bit of an interview with my father now you know you've seen him on a few videos we've been fitting coving he's had little cameos where i've had him in the background he still works he's virtually coming up to 80 still running the business even though i have to guide him on a few things yeah you know what it's like but i thought it'd be nice just to sit down with him when we've got a spare friday and it is a friday that we can just talk over what it was like for him when he started in the trade and how it could be slightly different to how people are starting in the trade now. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to sit down when we're quiet and actually just go through a few things. And a lot of you will be interested in this because I, I, I don't like using the word like old school and old school painting and dinosaur because to be fair my father and brian are far from that they've embraced newer paints they've embraced the newer technologies they're prepared particularly my father prepared to spend money on things that make as i always say to you work smarter not harder we spend on these sprays we spend on the um extraction you know the the max vax we spend on the murkers we are a small firm that has moved with the times. Now, I think what we'll do, we'll cut to my father and let him tell you what it was like when he was an apprentice, when he left school, what his plans were for leaving school and what he wanted to do and how he ended up getting into painting and decorating. And hopefully if we've got enough time, I mean, it might be a bit of a lengthy video, it'll take us, it'll be like a step back in time. It'll be like a... Looking back in a journal of a scrapbook of what it was like in the, the 50s, the stroke 60s, 70s, 80s and coming into 90s. Now, I've been with the firm, I've worked for my father since 1990 and you can see clearly I've been to college, I've done my teacher training and I'm trying to help people on YouTube explaining a few things that if you've never been to college, there's, there's help out there particularly through me. But Back in the, the, the 50s, the 60s, we didn't have the social media of learning things like that. You, you had to learn proper painting and decorating through an apprenticeship, through going to college. And my father and Brian are examples of the old school painter and decorator that has served their time. So without further ado, Hugh Pugh, Barnum McGrew, Cuthbert Dibble and Grubb. I'll put you into my capable hands, my father, and hopefully he doesn't have to read off the auto cue too much, but he'll tell you about his life as a painter and decorator. And really that's why this, the title of this video is Life on the Brush. So um, let's pass you over to him. It's Doug Beckwith. Right, so here we are. I'm passing you over to my father and let him talk to the camera. I'm gonna say, don't be too critical. We're not natural actors, actresses, anything in between. It is a case that we are as natural as we possibly come. So I'll pass you over to him now and he can tell his life story. Hello, everybody. Um, just thinking how things have changed and standards of etiquette over the years. I left school <coughs> at 15. Um, for the last two years prior to leaving school, I always wanted to be a painter and decorator. Now a friend of my father's, um, 
he'd known him for quite some time and he got a, a very high standard decorating company in Nottingham well known at the time until his retirement and um, I started I got an interview and he set me on at 15 I left school in September in the August and left school yes I left school in August and started in September with him now the first morning he did instruct me that get some a white jacket and a brown bib and brace now you might think how comical a bib and brace in brown they're surely joiners overalls but no apparently this is going right back because he was one of the old school and he wanted to bring me up like that <coughs> and uh, so that first morning left home it took me about five minutes to walk to the workshop and they said get there for 10 to 8 so I went in a white jacket, brown bib and brace and opened the gate to the workshop and the other men, about five, were all lined up at ten to eight ready to leave the job, leave for the job at eight o'clock. This is how strict he was. Now of all the years I worked for him, I worked for him from 15 till I was 21 I always called him Mr. Piers. There was no familiarity like it is today. Hey, whatever your name is, John, Brian, it was always a Mr. Piers and addressed him as so. And uh, so that first morning, he took me to one side and he said, I don't want to see you coming to work in overalls. He says, that's not what we do. He says, bring your overalls in a bag with your lunch and then we get to the job then you put your overalls on and then you start work so that was a standard it already set but everybody had to be there by 10 to 8 in the morning that's how strict and strict he was and uh, then we left for the job now i'm just thinking the first sort of jobs i'd be doing um i'm going to interrupt on this what what year are we looking at then now you're talking 1959 1959. September 1959. So you left school at the age of 14, 15? No, 15. I left at 15. 15. I was 15 in the June and started in September. And um, then we'd uh, I'd go to the jobs. And of course, you didn't know anything for a start. Um, and you'd be doing all the menial jobs. Can you pass me this? Can you pass me that? Uh, little jobs like show you how to burn a kettle out, clean it all out, sand it, put a knotting inside so it didn't bleed through when you put your paint in, all these kind of jobs, cleaning up, picking bits of paper up if they're doing papering, all these kind of menial jobs that a basic apprentice would be doing until he got into things. Now, in the September, the end of September, um, I'd signed on at Baseford Hall College. Um, uh, to do painting and decorating course which I did sign on um, also um, we signed up for having proper apprenticeship in dentures now I don't think they do in dentures now in the building trade you had a you signed by the employer you had to sign it as the employee all the rig rules and one thing or another and you had to go through that and you wouldn't get that certificate until you'd finished finish your apprenticeship. Now I've I've got the indentures because when I started in 1990, I did the same process as what you'd be going through. Yeah. I did my indentures for the apprenticeship, which was separate to being the actual college element. It was a separate thing altogether. But I had four years at college. Now you were going through college. What was that like then? Going through college, very interesting actually. Um, we did all the usual things, burning panels off. They had display areas that you'd have a door, half a door, a uh, filling area, a freeze area, a dado area, and you might be burning the door, you'd be burning panels off separately, but then you'd have a, a job to decorate whatever colour schemes they wanted you to do, or you could pick your own schemes, and you'd paint your woodwork, after you'd done all this preparation but it was all down to basically preparation all the time you might spend a whole day rubbing a, a four foot by 
three foot panel down until you get it like glass well obviously it wouldn't be commercial to be doing that today it wouldn't be obviously commercially viable but that was to get you into it that you could really get a good finish and if that's what you were requiring which obviously you were and uh, so I'd say I'd sign the uh, 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 indentures and kept on with the uh, college course and gradually working through now in those days um, we went to college I did three I did three days three days a week no well, I'm telling you wrong I did two days a week full time off work boss let me go and then I did two nights in my own time didn't get paid for that got there for 6.30 and finished at 8.30 that was in my own time now how many would want to do it in their own time today probably, probably not probably what, not that many what were you doing in the evening classes then was that still the city and guilds element or is it something else no that was all part of it from day one it might have been technical drawing it might have been uh, just general subjects and was was it a case that you were always going to go into painting and decorating or what did you fancy doing when you were going to leave school no i didn't fancy doing anything else i always thought that be ideal be ideal going into painting and decorating that's what i wanted to do i was pretty good at art at school and um, that's how it sort of evolved from there so we went through well, i'll cut a long story short did all my apprenticeship uh, got me indentures um, I got my city and guilds, basic city and guilds first I took the basic city and guilds then I went on for another 12 months did the advanced craft from then on another did another I don't know whether it was 12 or 2 years it might have been 12 months doing um, F the FTC which stood for full technological certificate that was in a three-part thing and I took that I think that was over a 12 months period finished that so I was now 21 after I'd done the FTC passed that and then uh, two of the traf craft teachers at the college they'd been watching me uh, had done very well with the qualifications and everything else and said why don't you go on to be an interior design course which they did do at the College of Art and I thought hmm that would be all right rather fancy that so that would be F end up with the qualifications FIBD which is, is fellow of the Institute of British Decorators so you'd be into interior design uh, that was a I'm just thinking I think that was about a five year I might be stand corrected on that it was either three or five years but a full-time course now at that time uh, we're talking about 1964 then well the Labour government had just come in and it was Harold Wilson now when I first decided to go on this interior design course um, I had to pay I'd get a grant now the grant was don't can't quite remember what, what it was but whatever that figure was I thought I could manage that I obviously wouldn't be earning anything and my parents said well we'll fund you anyway you know we can stay at home and give you some <laughs> obviously a bit of spending money I could do a few spare time jobs at night or weekends to earn a little bit of money and um, I thought well I'll go on to that so I signed it all up and everything and there was one other chap that came with me as well just the two of us were going to go so from being 15 everybody else had dropped by the wayside or finished and they were either going to keep working with the firms or start on their own so I'd been doing quite a few spare time jobs to try and get some money together working at nights weekends girlfriend never saw me I was always working working till 10 11 o'clock at night on pr little private jobs all through recommendation anyway uh, it came up that Harold Wilson came in thank you very much 
and he classed that course as a vocational art vocational arts course and he cut the funding down by half now I can't remember the exact figures but to cut it down by half was just ridiculous and I wasn't prepared to put up with that so I thought right I've been doing spare time jobs parents knew quite a few people I thought I'll start on my own so that's what I did so I didn't bother they did say they'd keep funding me but no I didn't want to do that so I was going out with a girlfriend at the time wanted to get engaged and I thought no I'll start on my own so that's how I started on my own so this is 1964 funding for the interior yeah. design had finished yeah and you'd already got your advanced craft and you'd oh, finished, yes. you'd already got your advanced craft you'd and finished the FT, it, done the FTC and you've done the FTC yeah. so you're fully qualified yeah what age were you then at this 1964 to put it into perspective I started in business in when I was 21 so you started in 1965 yeah in business yeah at the age of 21 yeah that's correct but fully qualified but and and if you take it because I'm talking through you'd started at 15 had six years working with the firm learning the ins and outs of actual proper decorating as well as your college and you felt ready to go into business well I ain't got a lot of choice really no I could have gone back to the old firm but I didn't mm. want to do that um, so I started in business bearing in mind that I couldn't drive I was never really interested in driving I'd had motorbikes from the age of fifth well scooters and mopeds and motorcycles and hence that's why we're in the office and if you <laughs> it's a bit of a shrine to Isle of Man TT we've got pictures of the <laughs> motorbikes which some of these bikes my father does actually own as well hence why the office is well as we say au natural it's it's where we work and where we get the paperwork yeah, done. It is. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, carry on. So, right, started on my own. Uh, I couldn't drive. So what's the first thing I should have to do? Take driving lessons. So I booked driving lessons. Well, you could say, how do you get all your ladders about? And all your materials? And did you get enough work coming in? Well, I was just one person on my own. You didn't need a lot of work and things escalated, people recommended me and that's how it went on. So I, I passed my test, uh, wife actually, the girlfriend at the time, she'd got a car, she was on a second car and she'd run a bit of stuff about but it was mainly my dad that run things to the job. He'd only got a Volkswagen Beetle, he put a roof rack on and took it round to the jobs and then when I'd finished, of course I'd still got my motorbike then, I could get back until I passed my test. Then I bought a, well I passed my test, went down to Cartergate Motor Company and bought a second hand uh, Ford Thames van, second hand, traded motorcycle in. So ran off now, I'm fine, got my van. Did it have a roof rack on it? Uh, yes it did have a roof rack, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I couldn't manage without a roof rack because I, I was doing outsides as well. But uh, so then... It gradually built up and I thought, I've got a lot of work on. I shouldn't mind taking an apprentice on. So 12 months later in 1966, um, I was in, oh, I was in the, uh, now it was the Master Painters Federation originally. It's changed about three times. Which is now the PDA, which is the uh, Painting and Decorating Decorate. Association. Was, yeah. And uh, so I'd already joined that. I joined at 21, so I was going to all the meetings and I was the youngest member there. They were all ages from my age up till in their 80s, members that had been members years. I went to various uh, dinner dances and things like that. And it's surprising, recommendation, if you're doing a good job, how it escalates and you get more work. So I set my apprentice on. Um, Where did you get your apprentice from? Uh, through the painting and decorating, through the uh, well federation. The feder it. Federa it was the Federation of Master Painters at that time. That's what it was. And they've got people applying to them. For well, I, I, I spoke to them about it, 
and they said oh we'll uh, if you advertise we'll advertise it in our journal and put it in the evening post and uh, I had a two or three came and then uh, Brian turned up they didn't the others didn't really seem too suitable Brian turned up and uh, I thought no it seems a likely lad is keen his parents came with him well his mother anyway and uh, I said right I'll set you on so I set you on and he's still with me now and Brian and Brian was working with me last week Brian's coming up to the age of 73 Three. because again he was only 15 when he started and left school in 1966 and I did exactly the same for him as I'd been given my opportunity as well I did him indentures and I sent him to college and paid for all that and it's been well worth it so he's qualified as well he didn't and he didn't do the uh, FTC but he, he did, did his advanced craft he did his advanced craft and that's why there's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek joke with the side of our van it says qualified staff supervised, supervised by, by experts, experts. <laughs> we just we just always have a, a row on who's who <laughs> but that's that so we're in 1966 moving forward on to how has painting changed from then to what you're doing now i mean well, we know we've got the transition that we're, well we're mainly water-based paints now, now i'm going to drop back now I'll diverse a little bit going back to when i was an apprentice what we used to do in the early days um, we used to make our own putty up now do you know how to make your own putty up we had to do it we had big tubs of whitening linseed oil a big stainless steel work top in our workshop and that was one of my jobs right they showed me how to do it get it to a certain consistency consistency it's malleable in your hands it's suitable for putty in and used to get you whitening put the linseed oil in mix it all up like dough until you got it into the right consistency and that was that job done that was one you wouldn't be doing anything like that today everything's ready made for you the other thing is we used to do um, a lot of cellars in the Nottingham Park big houses and what they used to do down there was lime wash now lime wash we had to purchase that well I was sent down in the van uh, to Midland Plastering Company on Canal Street been long gone now multi-storey car park there usual thing and you went round the back right my lad what do you want uh, boss has sent me down three buckets of slack lime please right go round there dig it out and it was just like thick thick cake and you dug this slack lime out put it into these buckets and then loaded it on the van took it back to the workshop and uh, how you mixed it up was it was for sellers you used to get it mix it up until it was suitable for brushing we didn't do any roller work in those days and you had to brush it on now to make this up you mixed it up it was that thick and you had to drop of water at a time so you didn't get it get all the lumps out of it and then it was just right for working now the binder that you put in was boiled oil you'd put percentage of boiled oil in depending on how much you got in your bucket put that in not only that you put uh, about two tablespoonfuls to about a bucket of methylene blue now anybody that remembers uh, dolly tubs years ago when they used to ponch you probably wouldn't remember those they used to ponch all the clothes and to get them white they'd put a drop of this methylene blue in when it was wet it dry when it was wet it was blue but when it dried out it bleached it out and it was white that's why you put the methylene blue in the boiled oil that was to bind it so it didn't come off on your clothes uh, so that's what you did with that that was just an interesting thing you won't be doing anything like that today but it used to kill all the bugs with it being lime wash down in cellars use tubs and tubs of it mixed up you know big cellars in the park that we were doing and anybody who doesn't know the park of nottingham 
It's just near Nottingham Castle. It's in the grounds underneath Nottingham Castle. And it, all the houses there are huge. Um, Victorian. They all, yeah, they were built from about 1870. Uh, it was the original. It was all that estate was owned by the Duke of Newcastle. And he owned all the, prop, well, all the land and then buildings were built. But they're all the top people in Nottingham. Lace manufacturers, uh, rally. <coughs> players, all the big um, business people, business people, solicitors, they all lived in these big houses with servants. Now, we had one particular customer, um, I can name names now because they've been long dead, but there were big lace manufacturers in Nottingham, known all over the world, and they had big factories in Nottingham uh, on Alfred Road, uh, and they made so much money they were very, very wealthy. In fact, when I went there the first time as an apprentice, I'd only be about 15 or 16 then, um, they had a butler full time. He lived in a house that about a mile away that the owners of the house, well, they owned it. And while everybody was working for them, we all worked for them for years, the butler. Then he used to turn up in the morning and he used to do all his duties. Now they had two cooks, one full-time maid, a part-time maid and a housekeeper. And uh, the butler, the sh no, the chauffeur, he had a house just round the corner and she'd pick the phone up and he had a big Bentley at that time. Well, they always had Bentleys. And she'd ring him up and she'd say, Charles, uh, can you pick me up in about half an hour, please? I won't run into a business meeting or I won't take him to the coast or wherever. And he'd get the car, he'd walk round. They had big garages there. He'd get the car out and he'd pick her up and then go. So that's how it's changed. But when I first went there, the boss said, now, if you happen to come across the lady of the house, bearing in mind, I used to call him Mr. Beers all the time. So we'd always got that standard and everybody that worked for us and other trades as well, builders. If you came across the lady of the house, you'd have to address her as mom. Good morning, mom. And don't make any other conversation unless she does. So that's the respect you had. Now, how things have changed. Would any youngster today say, I'm not calling them mom. They'd say, hey, up me duck, you all right? Wouldn't they? Definitely. Don't you agree, Phil? I agree. And on that note, I'm going to wind this section of the video up and we'll do a part two and we'll come back after this one. So I'm going to say thank you very much and we'll see you in a little while. So there we have it. Now we're going to do sections like this because there's obviously a lot to tell and it's not fair to do you an hour all in one go. What I'll be doing is doing another section like this and probably do it in sets of three. So please bear with us. And after this video, there'll be another one for you to watch where we'll probably move into the 20th century. Well, that's probably a bit rude, but you know where I'm coming from. Milord. <laughs>